no right to his property. He has a duty, however, to maintain her from his property, unless she places at his disposal her property. If a divorce takes place, then when she leaves, she leaves with her property, and he leaves the marriage with his property. At all times in the marriage, what is his is his, and what is hers is hers. Not like someone who said to her husband, what is mine is mine, and what is yours is mine. Subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom has ordained laws of inheritance. And laws are in, of inheritance are synchronized, connected with the functions of the male and the female. In consequence of which a son gets two shares to a daughter's one share. The modern godless world denounces that as discriminatory against women. No, should be equal share. Why two shares for a son and one share for a daughter? The answer? Because he, the son, has an obligation to maintain his wife. Whereas she, the daughter, does not have any obligation to spend from her own wealth to maintain herself. This is why he gets two shares to her one share. The modern God this world says, well, we don't need a man to maintain us. Women themselves, men don't have to maintain them. Well, the only way a woman can maintain herself is if she also goes out and works the way a man works to be able to earn her livelihood. And in the process, will she become just like a man? Which brings us to another verse of the Quran on the subject of the mechanics of marriage in Islam. The first one was kawwam, men having a measure of authority over women. A man must maintain and guard and protect, in consequence of which women must be obedient to their husbands, to Allah and messenger their husbands. But now we come to the second verse, second passage from the Quran on the mechanics of the male-female relationship in marriage. It's a particularly beautiful passage. And I was sitting in a conference in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Must have been the year 2001, I think, uh, 2000. It was a conference on business in Islam organized by the International Islamic University. And they put me to sit down up in the front row, Sheikh Ibrahim. And on the platform was uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim. And then someone came forward to recite the Quran at the beginning of the program. And as he was reciting, Allah revealed to me what I didn't know before. Praise is due to him. I had heard the ayat many times before, but I've never understood it the way I understood it at that moment. Praise be to Allah. It came like a flash. Today I received an email from one of the most outstanding Muslim women of Australia, a white 
woman who became Muslim. I wish she could come to Trinidad sometime. Our sister Shifa Mustafa. Shifa Mustafa wrote to me today saying that she had read an article, an essay I wrote and written on the philosophy of gender in Islam. And as she read that essay, it reminded, he, it reminded her of a video of a lecture of mine that she had seen. Now, she found so far, never met me. And in that lecture, I had dealt with this, this passage of the Quran. And it was absolutely astonishing to her that for the first time, she had understood what Allah was saying in this passage of the Quran on the philosophy of gender. Here is the passage. Allah says, He takes a load. He takes a load by the night. What does the night do? The night shrouds, it covers, it conceals with such beauty and splendor in such a mysterious way. Yadusha. And then Allah went on to take another oath, an oath by the day. Tajalla and by its bright light, dazzling light, nothing concealed, nothing hidden, everything open opposite to each other, the night and the day. And then he went on in the third verse to say, وَمَا خَلَقَ الزَّكَرَ وَالْوُنْتَ He now takes the institution of gender, the phenomenon of gender, and he likens it to the phenomenon of the night and the day. And it was that link which was revealed to me while I was sitting there in that conference, like a flash. That there is an analogy, an analogy between the night and the day and the male and the female. And if you did not understand what Allah was saying, now he comes in the fourth verse to tell you what is already implicit in the third verse. Now he makes it explicit. Inna sa'ayakum shatta. Inna sa'ayakum la shatta. You are functionally different. The male and the female are functionally different. You have different functions to perform, but you can't do it on each other. You are interdependent and yet functionally different. You are interdependent and yet functionally different. The Prophet said Islam about the interdependence. He said, women are the twin halves of men. Twin halves. That establishes the interdependence. And the Quran speaks and says the same thing. They are your garments, your clothing. You can't do without clothing. <laughs> you can't do without clothing. They are your clothing. You can't do without them. And you are their clothing. They can't do without you. And so you are interdependent. So why this fight? Why this adversarial relationship? The only good man is a dead man. <laughs> oh, you heard it before. <laughs> All men is safe. The only good man is a dead man. Why this fight? Why this adversarial relationship? Why this rivalry between the male and the female? Well, you can't do it without each other. You are interdependent. Hmm? 
Not only are you interdependent, but you are functionally different. The day has its functions to perform. And the night has the functions to perform. It is only when day is day, and when night is night, the day and night will be attracted to each other. And day and night can come together in harmony and in happiness. It is only when day is day, and the night is night. When day fulfills the functions of the day, and night fulfills the functions of the night, the day and night will be attractive to each other. The day and night can come together in harmony and in happiness. This is part of the mechanics of marriage. That attraction is very important. The attraction of the male and the female for each other, it is like the electricity of a community, of a Jamaat. And we do not want that that attraction should be destroyed. You put men to live in one Jamaat and women to live in another Jamaat. Men and women in separate worlds. There are Jamaats like that. No woman in the masjid. A woman went in the masjid. Marabella, the big one. She went to perform her salah. It happened. A senior member of the Jamaat, the masjid Jamaat, the management, went in front of the woman as she was performing salah and began shouting at her. I have to mention this, I wanted to go into the recording so that future generations will be able to hear what I'm saying here tonight. He began shouting at her. We don't want any woman in this masjid. Out! The woman continued with her salah. Did not stop. And the man counted, continued shouting like a donkey. When the woman finished her salat, she got up very quietly and peacefully to leave, without speaking a word, without protesting. Even when the woman was leaving peacefully, the man shouted at her as though she was a dog. Because that Jamaat wants to put women in one world and men in another. If you have to address a class and there are women in the class and you're a man, they put up a parda, a screen. So he behind the parda and them behind the parda. And they only hear in his voice. It's a dangerous Jamaat. The danger is they put women, men and women in two separate worlds. But day and night do not belong to two separate worlds. They are interdependent. And yet functionally different. When the day performs the function of the day, and the night perform the function of the night, then there is attraction between the two. And this is why we mentioned today in the khutbah, the best role for the men is the first, and the dangerous role for the men is the last. And the best role for the woman is the last, and the dangerous role for the woman is the first. Why the danger? Because of the attraction. We do not want to eliminate that attraction. We want to control it within the limits prescribed by Allah. Why? 